Welcome to this podcast, The Role of Social Partners in Securing High-Quality Effective Apprenticeships. There is a a consensus that apprenticeships provide a number of significant benefits. They enable young people to acquire the skills and competences to make the transition from school to work. They provide coordination between the world of education and the world of work. They provide employers and enterprises with a stable and reliable pipeline of qualified workers. And they also provide a cost-effective form of delivery of vocational education and training. These benefits have been acknowledged at the national, European and global levels. At the national level, countries have made great strides to review and adapt their apprenticeship systems. EU member states have adopted a recommendation to develop quality and effective apprenticeships and the European Commission has established a European Alliance for Apprenticeships, EAFA, which aims to strengthen the quality, supply and overall image of apprenticeships across Europe. EAFA members can benefit from apprenticeship support services which provide online resources and networking opportunities that enable like-minded individuals to connect, learn, and act. EAFA has been renewed recently, and the quality of apprenticeships has been highlighted as both a priority and an objective of the renewed EAFA. At the global level, the International Labour Organization is in the process of setting a standard for quality apprenticeships. The final decision will be taken at its International Labour Conference next year in 2023. This podcast is going to put the emphasis on the contribution provided by social partners, representatives of employers and workers' organisations, to securing high-quality, effective apprenticeships. The first part of this podcast will discuss the developments of quality standards for apprenticeships and the involvement of social partners at international and European levels, with representatives of the European Commission and the ILO. The second part would explore the same topic, but this time asking representatives of employers and workers' organisations at the European and national level for their views. So, today, first up is Anna Carrero, who is the Deputy Head of Unit for Vocational Education and Training in the European Commission, followed by Ashwani Agawal, who is a Senior Skills and Employability Specialist in the ILO. More specifically, both are responsible for apprenticeship training. So, Anna, over to you. Many thanks, Jeff, for the introduction and the warm welcome. I'm really delighted to be here today with Ashwani Agarwal and to discuss the importance of standard setting when it comes to achieve quality and effective apprenticeships. And of course, the crucial role social partners play in implementing and promoting these standards. As Jeff mentioned, let's not forget that promoting quality is one of the four objectives of the European Alliance for Apprenticeships. We all agree that apprenticeships are a key tool to facilitate school-to-work transitions, but they can only serve learners and employers uh, if for their purpose if they are of high quality. So that is why in March 2018, the EU member states agreed on a council recommendation for a European framework for quality and effective apprenticeships, following, of course, consultations with cross-industry European social partners. After some years of implementation, last year, we reported on how this recommendation has been put into practice at national level. And although there is still room for improvement, there are many positive examples of national reforms all over Europe. A nice example, very relevant for this podcast, is the Greek reform of their apprenticeship system that allows for a stronger involvement of social partners. As for the ILO, important progress uh, has been made towards a recommendation on a framework for quality apprenticeships. So here we are today, Aswani. Many thanks for being here. So we can learn a bit more about international standard setting. We would be really interested in knowing a bit more about the ILO's proposed framework for quality apprenticeships. What similarities do you see with the European framework for quality and effective apprenticeships? Thank you very much, Anna. First of all, inviting a representative of the ILO to share 
its perspectives and provide more details on the standard setting process and the new instrument on quality apprenticeships. As Jeff has also mentioned about the benefits of quality apprenticeship and you have very clearly elaborated on the need to promote as well as regulate apprenticeships uh, while through the rules of social dialogue to ensure their quality, providing benefits and protection to apprentices as well as enhancing the attractiveness of apprenticeships. Uh, standards, legal frameworks are required and member states, both of say European Union as well as ILO, which is a global one. So we have 187 countries who are our members. They look uh, forward to have some kind of a global standards, which they can review and adapt to their national standards while proposing national frame, legal frameworks for apprenticeships. Now, ILO used to have international labor standards on apprenticeships. The first one was enacted in 1939 and later on the next one was Recommendation 117 in 1962. However, since the juridical replacement of the Recommendation 117, apprenticeship was not comprehensively addressed under any subsequent ILO instruments. So there was a clearly a gap. So this gap was noticed by the ILO constituents, particularly the workers representatives, as well as the government and employers uh, representative. And they decided to develop a new standard on quality apprenticeship to bridge the regulatory gap and provide guidance to the member states in developing and implementing effective systems of quality apprenticeships. And Anna, as you are right, rightly mentioned in, the, uh, in your question also, this is now in the minds of many countries, particularly from the Europe, that if there is a uh, framework for European countries and if there is an international framework also comes, then to what extent there is a similarity or to what extent they will be dissimilar. So Anna, I would like to inform you that while drafting the reports and questionnaires, the ILO considered the European framework for quality and effective apprenticeships. And there is a significant alignment between the two frameworks. But again, I'll say that ILO's framework, as Jeff has mentioned earlier, is still in the making. And it is likely to be finalized next year during the International Labor Conference. ILO's proposed framework includes a recommendation on all the 14 criteria of the European framework. Specifically, ILO draft instrument on quality apprenticeship recommends the member states to establish a regulatory framework in consultation with employers and workers organization that specifically specifies occupation specific or general standards for the minimum age or any educational qualification if needed for admission, occupational safety and health measures, learning outcomes, duration, appropriate balance between off the job and on the job learning, nature of supervision required, assessment procedures and the qualification acquired. There are some other aspects also uh, which are details are given in the proposed instrument. Uh, the proposed instrument also uh, requests the member states to ensure that apprentices receive adequate remuneration or other financial compensation. And they are entitled to holidays and compensation for work-related injuries and illness. They should also have access to social security and maternity protection. And that apprentices are governed by a written agreement. It also asks members to promote equality and diversity in quality apprenticeships and facilitate the transition from the informal to the formal learning. With this one, I have just briefly summarized uh, the, uh, the key features from the proposed instrument. As you can see, Anna, most of these features are also part of the European framework. So I can say there is a significant alignment between the two. Thank you. In, 
Indeed, thanks a lot. Thanks for the historical overview of all the steps that were taken towards uh, this work and also for explaining uh, the level of alignment of uh, both uh, standards. I, I am very glad to see that, of course, uh, your concerns are about quality, learning outcomes, working conditions. Uh, so we are all working in the same direction. But let me focus on a very specific topic now, which is the main topic also of, of the podcast today, and it's about social partners and social dialogue. So what would be the role of social partners uh, in quality apprenticeships according to the ILO uh, standards? Thank you, Anna. I think this is the very important question. and. So let me first start with this one. ILO is the only UN agency which is tripartite. Means ILO members are not only government representatives, but also employers and workers. So any uh, uh, normative instruments uh, which is developed in the ILO are done together by the governments, employers and workers together. So all the international standards are developed. So this is a very unique process and it gives a clear advantage also if you see that social partners have the ownerships of the standards and which is a crucial factor which facilitates the their engagement in their implementation. So, so right from the beginning, it's not about the standard on apprenticeship. Any standards developed by ILO are through a tripartite process. So it's a big, biggest advantage of the ILO uh, constitution. And now I come specifically to the, uh, uh, the conclusion which has been adopted during the, this year's International Labour Conference by government, employers and workers of 187 countries. Uh, I'm giving the key features of that one, which specifically uh, mentions that how the framework is going to address uh, the role and engagement of social partners. For example, the conclusions specifically em emphasize the involvement of social partners in the design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of systems, policies, and programs for quality apprenticeship. There is a separate clause very clearly uh, before the details go, it says they should be involved in all the processes. It also says ensure the effective engagement of social partners the conclusions includes an overarching reference that members should implement the provisions of the proposed instruments in consultation with representative employers and workers organization very important point they should not only be involved in the uh, design but also in the implementation and then it also says uh, the proposal also recommends that social partners should be represented in the authorities responsible for regulating apprenticeships and are involved in creating an enabling environment for promoting quality apprenticeships and in facilitating the transition from the informal to the formal economy. So you can say very, very comprehensively uh, the various clauses and the provisions in the proposed instrument specifically mentions about the need and the requirement for taking any decision in active collaboration with the social partners. And finally, not only this one, they also the conclusions also says that the members should take measures to continuously develop and strengthen the capacity of social partners. As you know, only a capacitated social partners or employers and workers organization can effectively contribute to the process of uh, framing laws, policy systems, as well as implementing and evaluating them. Thank you again. Thanks for this question, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very interesting points that you raised. Uh, it's essential to, to ensure the ownership of the social partners uh, so employers can adhere to, 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 to these standards. And it is key also to, to ensure that they have the capacity to do that, as, as you rightly mentioned, uh, so, so they can do it uh, properly. At EU level, we also pay a lot of attention to, to these features. We have even funding instruments to increase the capacity of social partners. So I think we are uh, fully aligned on, on these messages. Um, 
yeah, uh, involving them in the design, governance, and, and implementation, it's indeed uh, key. Something I would like to underline as well is that the European framework also pays important uh, um, attention uh, to the support uh, to, to social partners and employers. Uh, they need to have employers uh, financial means and other type of non-financial support so they can enable uh, cost-effective uh, apprenticeships uh, being this also essential for uh, them to be sustainable so a lot of food for thought today uh, after talking to you uh, we found out we have a lot of similarities in the international proposed framework together with the European framework in place. And it has been really an honor having you today, uh, Ashwani, to share your insights and uh, uh, be part of this uh, podcast. So thanks, thank you very much for this. And thank you, Anna. Just I'd also like to add one final line. Uh, it, in the ILO, it's our privilege to work very closely with the European Commission. And last year, in fact, if you recall, we did uh, jointly a global uh, conference on uh, apprenticeship and there is a uh, proposal also that uh, once our new instrument is adopted let's do a, a second one also together with you and we always feel privileged to uh, work very closely with the uh, european commission and uh, we'd like to further strengthen our collaboration in prom promoting quality apprenticeship throughout the world thank you very much Indeed, let's keep in touch and let's strengthen this collaboration in the future. So now, Jeff, over to you. So thanks very much, Anna and Ashwani. So as can be seen from these two legal instruments at the European and the global levels, there is a clear commitment to involving social partners in the development of apprenticeship training. The next question is, what are the social partners currently doing to support the development of apprenticeship training? And our first speaker is George Christopoulos, who will be speaking on behalf of the European Trade Union Confederation. George has direct experience of implementing Greek apprenticeship policy as a member of the Federation of Educators in the private sector in Greece and of the Education Policy Development Centre of the Greek Confederation of Labour. So my first question, and that's to you, uh, George, Greece has recently revised its laws on apprenticeship training. Could you start us off by outlining why the involvement of trade unions is so important to securing quality and effective apprenticeships? Over to you. Hello, Jeff. The Greek Confederation of Labour believes that quality apprenticeship is a very important strategic tool for the successful transition from uh, education uh, to employment. Uh, this is very important for countries like Greece that belongs to a cluster of countries, especially in the south of Europe, with big structural problems in the labor market. Almost one out of two young people are outside the labor market. Nearly a quarter of people in the age between 15 and 24 are long-term unemployed and about 17% our needs. So we believe that the dialogue and the involvement of social partners uh, in VET and in apprenticeship is extremely important because we can uh, propose policies, uh, we can uh, participate and contribute to designing curricula, to design professional profiles in order to help for this transition from education to the labor market to be faster and to create a good working conditions uh, for young people who are entering the labor market. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'd like to ask you a further question, George. What role should social partners play in the monitoring of quality standards for apprenticeships? Are there specific actions that you're undertaking in that regard in Greece? This is a very important question for a country like Greece because uh, we see many irregularities and illegal practices in the labor market. Unfortunately, the last few years, especially the years of the crisis, uh, the authority of labor inspection has weakened uh, considerably, mainly due uh, to uh, the very strong lobbying by the employer sections in Greece. So, for example, very recently, we uh, 
produced a research as the Greek Confederation of Labour that shows that 40% of Greek workers are not paid overtime. Uh, this uh, is particularly very bad in private education where this percentage goes up to 70%. Uh, we did the past two years uh, visits to uh, secondary VET schools and we we're astonished to find out the vast majority of students were telling us uh, that they are working uh, as apprentices, they're not getting paid and they are terrified to report this to the authorities because they are scared that uh, they will be uh, put on a blacklist and they will never find a proper job again. So this means that there has to be uh, a collaboration between social partners of so these kind of practices and exploitations of young people should not happen. The contracts uh, should be respected. And also uh, for um, a very successful apprenticeship, uh, every company uh, should uh, hire a mentor, a guide uh, for the young laborers in order uh, for them to go smoothly and uh, productively into the new job. Um, and lastly, I would like to add that uh, in our recent research uh, about in service training, we found that we are second to last in Europe in in-service training and um, this is a very very obvious especially in small and medium enterprises in the bigger enterprises in Greece uh, this is a less problem so we believe that apprenticeships should work in-service training should work reskilling and upskilling should work in order to have a successful labor market and a successful and thriving economy Thanks very much, George. I mean, I think yeah, it's, it's particularly important to underline the importance of uh, looking after the rights and protections of young people in, as you say, uh, a labour market which is in, 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 in flux at the moment and clearly it's, uh, it's posing a lot of challenges for employers, uh, trade unions and also for apprentices themselves. So thanks very much for that. Let's move on to another question now, and that's more to do with the, the provision of, ent um, of apprenticeship places. This is always uh, a, 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 an issue of some concern for people who are planning uh, apprenticeship training. Uh, and uh, I'd like to now move on to uh, a representative of the association, European Association of Crafts and Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises, Lilian Volodinskis as Director of Social Affairs and Training. So Lilian, I think we all agree that SMEs are central to the development of apprenticeship training, but we know for a fact that uh, SMEs face considerable challenges. Uh, would you like to give us um, some information as far as that's concerned? What are these challenges and how can employers organizations help to address them? Over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Indeed, SMEs are key players for apprenticeship places. At the same time, as you said, they face several challenges to offer good and quality apprenticeship places. Let me simply mention three, what we consider the three main challenges. First, really, administrative burdens. It's one of the key elements which are regularly put forward. Second, particularly now, the selection of the right candidates to become apprentices, and thirdly, the cost of training for small businesses. I must say that from our perspective, SME United, as a European employers organization, we really see the need to have social partners closely involved in this because they are the best place to define the right conditions, the content and, and the rules of apprenticeship training. And in particular, since labor markets are evolving quite rapidly, to adapt these rules to the evolving needs of enterprises and of apprentices. And this is all what we need as part of the social dialogue, or I would tend to say autonomous social dialogue, or in partnership with governments and also vet providers. So thanks very much there, Lilian. I think that's a, a very important uh, introduction to the issue. You in your organization and your organizations at the national and sectoral level, what can you do to overcome some of these challenges? 
I would tend to say employers organization have a unique role to play for supporting SMEs and in particular micro enterprises to engage in apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. Let me simply mention that in the member states you already mentioned where apprenticeship has a long tradition, so said Germany and Austria, employers organization provide a large variety of support services and tools for SMEs. I can give you a few examples. The first one is about templates and support for uh, tackling all necessary administrative tasks and to facilitate the employers to comply with the formalities. The second one is about dedicated services for the assessment of learning outcomes in the company. And let me mention a third example, the support also to company trainers. Last but not least, another aspect is really to provide tools to, sele to select the most adequate candidates. I already uh, mentioned it with the right skills and competencies. And for example, they propose pre-interviews to find the right candidates. And I would like really to finish with uh, the relevance of awareness raising campaigns towards SMEs and employers in general, because really very often uh, youngsters and uh, small enterprises do not know enough the added value of apprentices for recruiting the right skills in their company. Lilian, thank you very much indeed. You obviously put your finger there on a very important point, and that's to do with the, the ways in which uh, micro and, and, and small, as well as medium-sized enterprises, can be assisted. It's a very complex area of training because there are so many different stakeholders involved, and you're absolutely right to, be, to point to the fact that uh, uh, employers, or, uh, em employers and enterprises, and particularly uh, small size ones need as much support as they can get so that they can do the important job of actually providing the places for apprenticeships, for apprentices. Uh, so thanks very much for that. And our third guest uh, is uh, Robert Plummer. He's a senior advisor for education and skills, and he speaks on behalf of Business Europe, which is the voice of business in European policy making. So are large size enterprises, Robert, are they facing the same sort of problems? Because clearly some of the things that Lillian has, has alluded to uh, are less, I would imagine, problematical for you in, in companies which have obviously bigger work workforces and dedicated services for the uh, question of taking on apprenticeships. So what, what challenges do you, do you see from your own perspective in the larger companies? Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, yeah, firstly, I, I think I, I would certainly echo the, the, the challenges Lilian uh, identified as well. I think to a certain extent we see those. Um, of course, there's the specificities of, of SMEs that, that uh, was well outlined. But I think for, for larger companies, um, there are also those issues around um, attracting uh, apprentices, being able to select apprentices um having a, a say in that part of the of the process um and i think maybe a bit perversely especially at the moment the the larger the company perhaps the harder it is to attract a sufficient number of apprentices at the moment because i think what we're seeing across all um, sectors of economic activity really is um labor and skill shortages and it's harder in a way for for larger companies sometimes to attract um, a sufficient number of apprentices now when they have more places that they can offer uh, than maybe an SME has. So as I said, it's a bit of a perverse um, situation. And I think COVID has had a particular role there if we think of some larger sort of hospitality uh, and catering establishments in particular. Um, people are maybe having a reflection that maybe that line of work is not as stable as it might once have been viewed as being and i think chefs is an on, obvious and, and prominent example uh, at the moment and, and one where an apprenticeship has played a key role um, and does play a key role in in training people to be a qualified chef um, but i think we we start to see a, a decline perhaps in in the interest in in that particular occupation in some uh, areas um, and, I, and so I think that um, can be one 
a particular challenge around not just the the provision of apprenticeships but also the the supply of, of people wanting to do an apprenticeship yeah. and i think at the same time we we also see a bit of a demographic shift in, in the role of apprenticeships maybe not so much a challenge but also i think an, an important point to mention is that whereas apprenticeships were typically focused on younger people i think now we start to see more of a shift towards um apprenticeships for adults of, as part of up and reskilling um, and so that can also provide some additional um, challenges in terms of the, the type of training that is provided and who provides the training uh, within the company context. Yes, I think that that's a, a, a very good point is and the youngsters are also and not so youngsters are uh, faced with a variety of choices and it's it may be the case uh, for large companies as well as small and uh, medium-sized enterprises that uh, it's not necessarily the first thing that they think of when they see how they're going to develop their education and training and uh, after that their careers so thanks very much for that. Let's, let's, let's ask another question now uh, we've mentioned or I quoted Guy Ryder at the beginning saying how important social dialogue is for the development of apprenticeship training. What, from your perspective, uh, makes for successful social dialogue? Do you have any good examples that you'd like to bring to our attention? Thank you. Yes, and, and indeed also at the European level, of course, as, as you also referenced, Jeff, we have the um, European Framework on Quality and Effective Apprenticeships, which um, the European social partners and our, our national members were, were very uh, strongly involved in, uh, in developing the content of that. So I think that was also a, a good example. Um, in terms of um, the, the role of social dialogue and, and social partners, of course, it varies from country to country, depending uh, a little bit on the, the nature of the industrial relations system. Um, but certainly there are some good examples. I mean, I think we often talk about Germany, but uh, with good reason. Um, and in, in, in that particular case, the social partners are involved in negotiating the underlying framework on which the Vocational Training Act is based. Uh, and this particular act regulates issues such as how much time the apprentice spends in the company and, and so forth. Um, I think another good example is, uh, is Estonia, where the social partners are involved at the, the local level uh, as part of the advisory boards of, uh, of vet schools. Um, they're able to feed in information on um, the, the current and projected skills needs to help inform the curricula. Uh, and so from that point of view, to really help um, build up and, and define the approach to uh, apprenticeships and apprenticeship schemes uh, with with real and, and, and credible knowledge and I think also when you um, you look maybe indeed thinking of what Guy Ryder said if you if you look at some of the more established and very well functioning systems in the European context um, it is the likes of, of Germany of Austria of Switzerland of Denmark that are those countries that have those generally very well functioning schemes but also um, those are very much built on strong uh, social partner involvement and, and social dialogue. And so as previous uh, colleagues have said, uh, the involvement of social partners in the governance is, is really a key aspect uh, for a well-functioning apprenticeship system. Thanks very much. What we hear as well, of course, is that it's often a little difficult for uh, social partners to be able to participate in the design and implementation of apprenticeship schemes. Often they don't necessarily have the capacity, either in terms of numbers, of quantity, or indeed in terms of quality. That is to say, do they know how to deal with some of these rather technical issues? And I think uh, what I'd like to do now is ask all three of you uh, if uh, you could give us your views on the ways in which uh, policymakers can support social partners in the design and implementation of apprenticeship schemes. And uh, so as not to complicate matters, I suggest we use the same uh, uh, run, that is to say, start with George, then Lillian, and then Robert. Uh, so would you give us your views uh, briefly on this particular issue? So let's start with you then, George. As I said before, the uh, the new legislation about uh, uh, VET and lifelong learning, um, is, is very good in terms of um, involving social partners 
and giving the the power to social partners to sit down discuss and um, um, propose policies for apprenticeship and for any other aspect of uh, vocational education training um, we believe that the social partners as i said before uh, should be the sole responsible um, players in uh, promoting and proposing things uh, in order to um, face uh, the huge challenges of the labor market for the shortages of uh, good and skilled uh, laborers um, and in order to um, create a boost for our economies especially in uh, very difficult uh, situations and periods like uh, the one that we're experiencing now uh, so yes um, it's very important that uh, governments uh, across Europe will give the opportunity for social partners to uh, take a decisive role into shaping um, VET policy and especially about apprenticeship as we're talking today. Thank you very much. Lilian, how about uh, you? What, what would you like to see from policymakers to support you in the SME environment? Uh, thank you, Jeff. I see a lot of convergence between us, social partners, for sure. What I would like to say, taking into account the current labor market challenges, policymakers, according to me, should give more autonomy to social partners for designing curricula, for apprenticeship conditions, for payment level. It is simply a matter of ownership at system level. And the last point I would like to make, not all social partners have the capacity to act in this way. Therefore, capacity building is one of the key elements which should be really implemented in the member states where apprenticeship is less developed and less common. Thank you very much, Lilian. Yes, uh, that's an important issue, uh, most definitely. And finally, Robert, over to you. Thank you. Very much agree with uh, with what my colleagues have said. I, I think in instances where um, social partners are not part of the of, of the governance or where it could be strengthened, there needs to be an openness at the national level um, to better involve them uh, and also to support them. Uh, indeed, if they're uh, smaller organizations, maybe with limited capacity, um, to help them to uh, to be able to play that role. Um, sometimes, indeed, that can be um, further financial support, training support, as Lilian referred to. Um, but I think the, the primary message here is if social partners are not already well involved, um, it's important that the approach at the national level is geared towards looking at how to better involve them within um, the domestic uh, apprenticeship governance. Thanks very much, Robert. Well, clearly there we've got something of a, a consensus in terms of the importance of social partners within the whole process and indeed the need for support for the social partners so that they can actually carry out these, uh, uh, the, these jobs. So um, I'd like to thank you all, all of you for the views that you've given. Thanks to, to you and uh, I value very much your insights. It's been much appreciated. And as far as our listeners and viewers are concerned, I would like to encourage you to share this ep episode with your colleagues and also join the conversation by sharing your views on the discussions on social media by using the established EU hashtag. The episode is available on YouTube as the role of social partners in securing high quality effective apprenticeships under the podcast series EAFA Vodcast. And it's also available on Spotify and SoundCloud as IAFA podcast. So many thanks to our guests for their views and many thanks to you for listening and watching. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.